Hey there, misfits. This is Kate. And this is Emily. Welcome to Horrorwood. not going insane that is not your voice that is the amazingly talented and wonderful and lovely emily marceau she is an actor here in chicago she's amazing i'm just gonna brag on you a little bit mom no please <laughs> you're i'm scared it's okay honey you're, i want to go home <laughs> she is a motion capture actor she uh did the video the blah 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 the video game <laughs> mortal Kombat. that's right right you nailed it yeah because i don't know anything about video games <laughs> uh she's also an audiobook narrator for children's books so they're probably not going to listen to this yeah a lot of crossover yeah and she's got a recurring role as nurse Susie on chicago med she also does a ton of theater around town um and she just finished up a show in st louis so Emily gets around you guys. <laughs> it's uh, yeah, unfortunately true. Yes. <laughs> um, but thank you so much for being here. Kale is still on her break. Just so everyone knows, like it's just like a busy time at Kale's work. She's a teacher. It's report card season. Her life is like insane. I will never be a teacher. Um, so anyway, <laughs> we, you know, we have some guests coming in and it's exciting because then you all get to be introduced to these amazing people. I'm super psyched to be here. I'm Yay! so excited. I'm so excited. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> this is a really sad, sad case. Um, it's also fairly recent, as in like the last seven or eight years. So there's a good chance you have heard about this person. And I I said this to Cassie when she was here for her first episode. I was like, I'm so sorry that it's not a fun one because you're such a lighthearted <laughs> person. Uh, this is definitely not a fun one. This is a rough one. Um, it's so senseless as murders typically are. Today we are talking about the amazingly talented, fun, beautiful inside and out Christina Grimmie. Oh, she was so talented and so young when she was murdered, which just adds to how horrific this is. Did you ever listen to her music? Oh, yeah. The minute you said that name, I saw her little like black eyeliner mm -hmm. face appear on my, you know, 2008 YouTube screen. Um, I had heard about her being killed and it seemed, I mean, here's what I know, Kate. I know nothing. You're going to learn a lot more about her. Oh, I'm scared. Okay. But before we get to that horrible night, let's talk about who Christina was in life. Christina Victoria Grimmie was born on March 12th, 1994 in New Jersey. She was a Jersey girl. Okay. Her passion for singing was evident even when she was just a toddler. She sang before she could speak, basically. She would literally sing herself to sleep. And in the mornings, she would wake up singing. Singing was just a part of her soul. When she was younger, she would make CD covers for herself with her name, like it was her album. And then she would take the CD inserts out from other CDs. So like a Whitney Houston CD, she would take out the insert with Whitney Houston and put her own in, which I just think is the cutest. Oh, no. I mean, as an aspiring actor, if you don't copy and paste your own face over the female lead in the live <laughs> action Peter Pan. What are you even doing? How are you living your life? Well, yeah, like I'm confused. <laughs> she knew she wanted to be a performer, but she was an introvert and kind of shy. So she wasn't pursuing auditions or anything like that. Instead, to scratch that performing itch, she'd borrow her parents' camera and record herself at home acting out skits that she would write and she'd sing songs and she would just like really let her personality come through. She was a goofball and always knew how to make her family laugh, especially her older brother, Marcus. 
He also went by Mark, so I might say Marcus or Mark throughout this episode. I'm talking about the same person. Okay, got it. The two of them were really close. She said that he was her role model. Mark said that she was hilarious, and in a documentary I watched about this case, her family showed several clips from home videos, and they said she would be absolutely mortified if she knew that they were showing them because they're all of her just being goofy, being a kid. And when they say she'd be mortified, like they say it jokingly. It's very loving. I don't want to give the impression that her family had anything but love for her. Right. Sorry. What is going on? Hold on. <laughs> I think I just need a little more coffee because yeah, I, I need that warmth. Also, this is literally every episode, so it's not like this is new. <laughs> I have my hot water um, perched on the the by your shoes in the closet. You have great shoes, by <laughs> the way. You. They're so beautiful. Thank you. Um, I never wear them. But I'm going to try not to clink them. <laughs> I mean, they're like amazing. I wish you guys could see them. They have like little metal studs all the way around the outside. Oh, I do wear those. Oh, they're amazing. I'm obsessed. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Where was I? Um, oh. So Christina not only sang, but also wrote her own songs. And the first songs she wrote were all about God. She, along with her family, were very close to their faith. They were Christians, deeply connected in their religion. Christina would read the Bible for fun. So that gives you an idea of how strong of a believer she was. And I can't stress it enough. This was a very close, very loving family. In addition to writing her own songs, Christina was known for singing covers. She loved to take a song and put her own spin on it, or as her brother Marcus would say, christina it. Then one day her friend Lauren came to her and said, look at this girl on YouTube. She has 30,000 followers. You sing way better than her. I bet you could get a huge following if you put your stuff on YouTube. And for Christina, this was a way to perform for an audience without actually having to do so publicly. She could film herself, which she was already used to. And if people booed her, she wouldn't hear it. So Christina decided, yeah, I think I will go on YouTube. Well, the people on YouTube definitely didn't boo her. The response she got was overwhelmingly positive. So she was excited. She started getting a little more confident. She went to her family and was like, wow, look at all the nice things people are saying. So she put more on YouTube. And she developed quite a following. One morning she woke up and she had like 50 emails from YouTube. So she assumed it was a spam thing. So she just like clicked them all and deleted them. And then 50 more popped up. So she deletes them again. And then 50 more pop up. Because if you're checking email on a desktop, only 50 emails show at a time. Right. And she's like, what is wrong with my account or what's wrong with my computer? Why am I getting all this spam? So she goes to her parents and she's like, can you look at this? Something's wrong with my computer. I keep deleting these emails, but they keep coming back. And her dad looks and he says, no, these are all new emails. There are, there are thousands here. They were all people commenting on her latest video, which I believe was a cover of Miley Cyrus's Party in the USA. And the comments were all very positive. So that's when she and her family all start realizing this is turning into something. I'm going to link her YouTube channel. I cannot stress enough how talented this girl is. She would play the piano while she's singing. I think she had some basic piano lessons when she was younger, but for the most part, she's self-taught and she could seemingly play anything. She's amazing. And if you watch her videos, you can really see her growth as an artist she started the channel in 2009 when she was about 15, and you can see the progression through the years. So Christina is becoming really confident in herself. All the positive comments really helped her grow, and it was this fun thing that she could do that she was really good at. Her brother would sometimes appear in the videos with her playing guitar, and she also made videos with one of her best friends, Sarah. She and Sarah met in kindergarten and were inseparable. And Lauren, the friend who encouraged Christina to get on YouTube, met her when they were in fourth grade. They met through Sarah. So the three of them were the best of friends from a really young age. And they were always over at the Grimmies' house. Christina, Christina's friends referred to her parents as aunt and uncle, which is just fucking adorable. That is so cute. The Grimmies treated everyone like family. 
Despite all the positive feedback Christina was getting online, her parents were concerned. Her mom, Tina, said to Bud, Christina's dad, his name was Albert, but everyone called him Bud. Tina said, the creepy man is going to see her. As we know, the internet is a dangerous place. It terrifies me that my nieces get on the internet. I hate it. Because you just never know who's watching you, who's hiding behind the screen. And anyone can say anything and do it under an alias if they want to do so because they're never held accountable. It's actually wild to me that Christina thought, like when she was first getting on YouTube, like this will be a real safe haven for me. I know I won't be able to see the people who might have negative comments. I'm like, oh my gosh, what sweet summer children we all were in 2009 to be like, yeah, actually this will be better. Exactly. Like nothing bad can happen to me because they can't see me. I'm like, man, yeah, you are not ready for what is about to happen online. I mean, that's the thing. Like my nieces, they're slightly younger than Christina was at that age. But, you know, the stuff that they post, my youngest niece especially, I'm just like, stop. You got to get off there. Don't use your name. Don't post any pictures. And I tell them all the time, everything on the Internet lives forever. So true. And you just don't know. Anyone can say they're anybody. It just, it terrifies me. Yeah. Well, and, you know, if you were a girl of a certain age growing up, like, you knew who, I feel like all of my friends were watching Mm -hmm. her on YouTube. Like, we all knew who Christina was. We all, like, had heard her covers. And it was, like, sort of a rise of that interesting parasocial thing where you're like, that's my friend. Right. She posts a video every week. Like, that's so fun. And there wasn't that remove of knowing that the creepy man could find you and stalk you and kill you. Like, that wasn't as prevalent yet. Exactly. And that was the thing you you kind of hit the nail on the head is that people did feel like they were her friend. Right. She She called all of her fans her friends. She made herself very accessible to them just through her videos and the way she talked to people through, you know, into the camera. I mean, she's so fucking adorable, mm-hmm. you guys. She's like, hey, guys, what's up? Like, I know. I went down a rabbit hole watching her videos. I was just like, this girl is so fucking amazing. Ugh. So unfortunately, as these things go, the negative comments started to come in. One person, one person online commented that they thought Christina had a big nose. And this devastated her. She was a teenager. You're already going through an emotional roller coaster when you're a teen. Everything feels heightened. Your body's changing. Your hormones are all over the place. It's a sucky time. So despite the thousands of positive comments, this remark really hurt her. She was in tears. On the documentary I mentioned earlier, it's on Investigation Discovery. Someone commented that YouTube is like the new schoolyard, and it's so true. I'd even extend that to say all social media is the new schoolyard. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah. cuz you can you can encourage people, you can connect with people, but you can also bully people and bring them down. It's a mm-hmm. scary place. We get nasty comments on our YouTube channel all the fucking time. Oh yeah. <laughs> and it's like the people making these comments have to know that the creators they're directed toward are going to see them. Yes. And they're hurtful. Like, do people really not have anything better to do with their time besides put negativity out in the world? I know. I. It's funny. I was just, I just recorded a short film that um, performed really well. I think something like over 100,000 people have seen it on YouTube, which is great. That's a fucking lot of people. <laughs> it's a lot of people. And I in some ways was really naive. I was like, oh my God, I'll go check out the comments. And like, yeah, like as it usually is, 99% of them are like overwhelmingly like, I love it. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. And there's this 1% that is so insidious where you're like, do you have any idea how hard it is to be an artist making art? Do you have any idea how many people like worked for months Mm -hmm. and, and killed themselves for like this thing that you're saying, that girl, she's she looks too fat. I hate her voice. Right. You know, right. it's just like, oh my gosh, wow, what a what um a humbling experience, honestly. To, like a, a welcome to this century yeah. of 
the kinds of pressures that creatives face when you put your work out there. It's so hard. And it doesn't matter how old you are either when you get there. I mean, I'm a full on adult and I'm I find I the comments hurtful. And they're and they're literally comments that like of things beyond my control. Totally. Like the way my voice sounds or what you know, whatever. And right. right. I can only imagine how a fifteen year old girl would be affected by that. I mean, she's a child, essentially. People yeah, suck. For sure. But Christina kept trucking along. And in 2010, just a year after she began posting on YouTube, her life and her career changed drastically. A woman by the name of Mandy Teefee saw Christina's videos on YouTube. Mandy Teefee might not be a familiar name to most, but she had a strong connection in the music industry. Mandy Teefee is the mother of Selena Gomez. Ooh. Foreshadowing. <laughs> Mandy and her husband, Brian, Selena's stepfather, reached out to the Grimmies. They actually contacted Marcus through his YouTube channel, I think because he was 18 and Christina was still a minor. And they said, hey, we want to manage Christina. Okay, sidebar. Yes. Can you imagine being the older sibling of uh, like an artist and being like, oh my God, this famous person is reaching out to me to work with my sister. Cool. Great. I'm, I'm fine. It's all fine here. There didn't seem to be any kind of jealousy or anything like this. This family is a saint. I, I bow down to the Grimmies. Incredible. They're really fucking amazing. Honestly, Marcus. Yeah. I mean, when we get into the rest of this story, you are going to fall in love with Marcus. He was just the number one protector of his sister. They were super close. You just don't find that, especially when you're that close in age, because they were only like a year and a half apart. That doesn't oh, always totally. work out, but they were super close. Yeah, I love that. Before long, Selena Gomez became Christina's mentor. So here's this young girl with a huge voice. She's an introvert. She does the bulk of her performing in her room at home. And now she's got Selena Gomez mentoring her and her parents managing her. Everything changed for Christina. Hmm. She entered a My YouTube competition in December of 2010, which ran for a couple of months. And when it ended in 2011, she placed second ahead of big name stars like Rihanna and Justin Bieber. Selena Gomez placed first. Oh, amazing. That summer, Christina opened for Selena and her band on their We Own the Night tour. She toured with them for six weeks. And since she was still a minor, that's the thing. She was only like 16 or 17 at the time. And oh she's performing gosh. in front of tens of thousands of people. She's still a kid. Because she wasn't 18 yet, she had to be accompanied by an adult for this tour. So that job went to her big brother. Uh. Even though he was still a teenager, he was technically an adult, so he became her chaperone. And he would often perform on stage with her playing guitar. Christina's mom couldn't chaperone because, unfortunately, she was dealing with some health problems. She'd been battling breast cancer for years. Mm -hmm. And I think Bud probably stayed behind to help care for her, so it made sense for her brother to be the one to go. I can only imagine... That they had a blast being out on the road together. I mean, like I said earlier, they they got along. Really, that can go either way. So thankfully for them, they got they were really close. Christina loved playing video games, and she and Marcus would often play together. They actually got matching tattoos on their arms. His said one P for player one, and hers was two P two P for player two. That is so cute. So freaking cute. I know. Christina specifically loved The Legend of Zelda on Nintendo. Her routine was that after performing a show, as soon as she was done and back on the tour bus, she would change into sweatpants, wash all the makeup off, and start playing Nintendo DS. <laughs> Two teenagers on tour with Selena Gomez, away from their parents, traveling all around the country. Sign me up. Come on. I know. I had that dream. I definitely <laughs> I've had this dream before. <laughs> they were They were living it. But Marcus took his role very seriously. He was her big brother, her chaperone, her protector. He said he had it ingrained in his head, I look after my sister. Their parents were nervous about her going out on tour, of course. Any parent would be. Her dad said his biggest concern was that she would get kidnapped. Which, like, for a parent's brain to go there, 
Yeah. I wouldn't even think about that. Like you go out on tour and get kidnapped. But he said she was <laughs> naive and just really nice and that she felt like everyone was a good person. I think because she was such a good person, she just assumed everyone was. Right. And a literal child. Like She is a child. And it was just hard for her to see that other people can be really evil. Kate, this isn't going to be a sad podcast, is it? This isn't going to end with like a sad story. I literally told you it was a sad one. <laughs> when I came in the door, Kate, like, Kate was like, hey, I just want to say really fast. I'm, I'm sorry. This one's pretty dark. I did. I tried to warn you. It's kind of fucking brutal, actually. No, I don't want it. Okay. I know. I really wish that. None of this happened. Yeah. But the tour with Selena went really well. Christina wasn't kidnapped. And that same summer, she released an EP titled Find Me, which debuted at number 35 on Billboard in the U.S. And she was a guest on the Ellen DeGeneres show that October. And Ellen called her the queen of YouTube because her popularity had skyrocketed. She truly was a YouTube sensation. Mm -hmm. Just a couple of months after her Ellen appearance in January of 2012, sorry, <laughs> that lamp just flickered and it was the scariest fucking thing. <gasps> oh my gosh. Oh my goodness. Okay. No. It's like, I'm not ready for the ghosts. Yes, please. That's a different episode. All right. <laughs> uh, in January of 2012, the Grimmy family packed up and moved to Los Angeles so Christina could pursue her career. This was a family who supported each other through everything. They could see that Christina was really making this career happen for herself, and they were behind her 100%. More opportunities were coming her way. She was performing more, making more TV appearances, and she was still working with Selena Gomez. In 2013, she opened for Selena on the Stars Dance Tour, which was Selena's first tour as a solo artist. On the tour, Christina performed songs she wrote for her upcoming debut album titled With Love, which was released later that year. Then the following year in 2014, she was asked to be a contestant on The Voice. Mm. Side note, I did not realize that they would sometimes recruit contestants. Oh. I mean, I should have realized that because no reality TV is real, but like... I had no idea. Yeah. For those not familiar with The Voice, that's the singing competition where they do a blind audition so none of the judges can see what the contestant looks like. And if they like what they hear, they turn their chair, which means they're interested in coaching and working with that singer. The show wanted her to perform Miley Cyrus's Wrecking Ball for her blind audition. Mm. Again, didn't know the show chose those those songs, thought it was the contestant. <laughs> really, I really yeah. didn't know anything about this. You're the naive one, clearly. I am. I am. Yeah. Geez. And okay. so Christina went to her family and she was like, oh my goodness, they think that I could actually sing Wrecking Ball because she just felt like that was too big of a song for her. And her family was like, well, if the producers think you can do it, great. Do you think you can do it? Saying like, if you believe you can do it, you will. So she sang Wrecking Ball and all four judges, which at the time were Adam Levine, Usher, Shakira, and Blake Shelton, all four turned their chairs. Mm. Her parents were so freaking excited. They, along with Marcus, were always in the audience for the show, just beaming. They were so proud of her. And on the show, she was asked who her inspiration was. And a lot of people would probably answer with a musical inspiration, like someone whose career they hope to emulate. But Christina said her inspiration was her mom. Oh. Because of her mom's health struggles, Christina wasn't sure she didn't get to see her reach the success that she was having. And I think watching what her mom went through and how tough she was really had an impact on her. Mm -hmm. Christina ended up placing third on the show, and she was thrilled with that. She was never like, "Ugh, why didn't I get first or anything like that. Mm -hmm. She was truly so grateful just to be there. She didn't take anything for granted. After The Voice came more tours, more writing, more recording, and she began working on her second full-length album. In 2015, she released more singles, and she also collaborated with Dove Cameron on a song for Dove's show Live and Maddie, that spring, she competed in the Macy's iHeart Radio Rising Star Contest and won, which meant she got to open for the iHeart Radio Music Festival in the fall that year. 
At the beginning of 2016, Christina showed no signs of slowing down. In February, she released her second EP titled Side A, and she hoped to release her second full-length album by the end of that year. The beginning of 2016 also brought some romance to Christina's life. (laughs) She worked with a small group of songwriters, one of which was Stephen Reza. It was a four-day writing gig of just being in the studio together, writing and making music. And Stephen and Christina really hit it off. After those four days were up, they were inseparable. The two quickly began dating and fell head over heels for each other. They shared similar interests. Both were in the music industry, obviously. And they both had a strong connection in their faith. They were really religious and spiritual. They both loved animals and were just all around good humans. They were the cutest. Christina would post cute Snapchats declaring her love for Steven. And it was just, it was all just really sweet. I did just look him up because I had to know yeah. what his face looked like. He looks like a very nice boy. Doesn't he? He looks like you would like find him in a skate park and you'd be like, I bet he's bad. But then he would like give you half a sandwich. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yes. You know what I'm saying? Like, perpetually in a beanie. But like, he he really thinks you should shouldn't talk about women that way, yeah, man. Yeah, you know exactly. Like, okay, great, got you. That I think that is a perfect description of him. <laughs> Christina also filmed her first movie role for the film The Matchbreaker. She plays a singer that the lead guy has been in love with for years, but she barely knows he exists. You can actually watch it on Freebie right now. I'll go ahead and tell you that I watched it for you. The movie itself is not great, but she's adorable. And that's what's important. Great. (laughs) That May, Christina was scheduled on a three-week tour opening for the band Before You Exit. She and Steven were bummed that they were going to have to be apart for so long, but they would call and text each other all the time. Marcus was going to accompany Christina, as he always did. Even though by this point she was an adult, she was 22 at this point, it was their thing. Marcus Mm -hmm. accompanied Christina on tour. He acted as her road manager, and he still played with her on stage. So it was kind of like he was on tour as well. But it doesn't sound like Christina was really looking forward to this particular tour. Number one, she's got this new boyfriend. It's still, you know, a fairly new relationship. So they're in that honeymoon stage. She just wants to spend time with him. And two, she was working on her second album, and she really wanted to focus on that. Mm. But it was work. Christina knew she had a job to do. And the last two dates of the tour were San Francisco and L.A. So she would finish at home, which kind of sweetened the deal. The day before she and her brother left was their mom's birthday. And the whole family went out to the Cheesecake Factory to celebrate. Just so pure. This family is the sweetest. I know. Jesus Christ. I'm like, we have to protect we have to protect them. We have to put them somewhere where they can't be hurt right? because the cheesecake factory, oh. I can't. The next morning, Christina and Marcus said bye to their parents and off they went. Christina and Steven stayed in contact the whole tour, calling and texting each other and being cute. Mm. They missed each other like crazy. Three weeks is a long time. And when you're in a new relationship, That's an eternity. They could be a new person when you come back. Who knows? And Christina just wasn't having much fun. She really wanted to be back home. The last stop before heading back to California was in Florida. They were performing at the Plaza Live Theater in Orlando, which was the biggest venue of the tour. So they get to Orlando, and on the day of the concert, Marcus calls home, and he talks to his mom, and he says, Hey, we're flying into LAX tomorrow. Can you have Dad pick us up from the airport? Very routine. As Bud put it, it was, quote, just another day. Yeah, kids fly in. I pick them up from the airport. No big deal. Before the concert that night, Christina posted a video on Snapchat, I think it was, just letting her fans know where she was. She says, if you're in the Orlando area, come on out to the show tonight. You know, typical thing you do as a performer, like, Mm -hmm. hey, I'd love to see you at the Mm -hmm. show tonight. And being that this was the largest venue of the tour, they were expecting a great turnout. A lot of people had already bought tickets, and one of those people was Kevin James Loible. Kevin Loible was a 27-year-old man living with his father and brother in St. Petersburg, Florida. When he wasn't working his part-time job at Best Buy, he was mostly just sitting alone in his room on his computer playing video games. 
According to Kevin's family and co-workers, he only had one friend, a guy by the name of Corey Dennington. And I'm not even sure we can really call them friends. They didn't hang out together outside of work, but they had grown up together. And Corey actually got Kevin the job at Best Buy. Hmm. I think Corey probably was just trying to be a nice guy to Kevin. He probably saw that he didn't quite fit in and just wanted to make him feel welcome. Kevin felt like he could talk to Corey. And really, he was the only one he could talk to because Kevin wasn't great with people. He was really awkward. And because of this, his managers at Best Buy had to keep moving him around to different positions because he just wasn't good with customers. You can't fire someone for being awkward or weird. And so over the course of the eight years that he worked there, they had to keep trying him out in different positions. Eventually, they moved him to the back of the store where he worked on computers for the Gweek, the Gweek, that's not the word, <laughs> for the Geek Squad department so that he wouldn't really have to interact with anyone. Jeez, that is a red flag. Yeah. The first of many. Corey said that Kevin came from a, quote, semi-abusive household. Oh, buddy. I don't know how a household is semi-abusive. It's either abusive or it isn't. It's like a toggle switch. You really, it's either doing one or the other, and it sounds like it's doing one, so. Yeah. I'm not sure if those were Corey's words or Kevin's. By all accounts, this was a full-on abusive household. Kevin told Corey that his mom used to beat him with a frying pan and she would throw dishes at him. Sorry, where does this get semi-abusive? Yeah, I'm not sure where that came into play unless he just thought that this was normal. Oh man, this is this is bad. This is It's okay. all bad. Great. FYI, it's all bad from yeah. here on out to the rest of the episode. <laughs> oh cool. Okay. All right, chill. Um Kevin also told Corey that his mom broke his brother's arm, but he doesn't say how. In 2010, Kevin dropped out of St. Petersburg College after attending for three years because he wanted to play World of Warcraft instead. I'm just going to pause and let that sit in. Oh, Oh, man. For those unfamiliar, World of Warcraft is an online role-playing game. You play with other people, like real people out in the world, but it's all online. You create a character. You go on quests. I've played it. It is. It is addictive, I will say. I dated a guy who played. He got me into it. The amount of hours he would sit in front of his computer playing that game, I I literally had never seen anything like it. Yeah. Have you played it? Okay, so it's funny that you dated a guy because I also dated a guy who played World of Warcraft. And to this day, he won't play another video game because he's like, it destroyed my life. I played. Holy shit. I played like nonstop. I can't ever go back there. Um, And it's, you know, it's something I think about a lot as someone who works in video games on some very male skewing titles. I'll say that. Mm -hmm. I uh, do motion capture for the most recent Mortal Kombat, which are very like deeply violent games, you know, and I think a lot about what it means that that is played primarily by men yeah um and what it says that um it's cited a lot in people who commit violent crimes that that was something they did and the thing is like it's not the game's fault right it it never is it's the person playing the game i do think a lot of times video games get blamed like we hear that argument a lot 100 percent yeah. Of, you know, like, oh, well, he played Mortal Kombat. You know, he played World of Warcraft. So right. obviously he was going to turn into a killer. No. I actually see it more the opposite, which is it's one of the few socially acceptable outlets where young men and boys can talk with other people. Mm. Like it's by planning raids in World of Warcraft, by by working together, you know, with other people, they get social interaction without having to leave their homes. Yep. And yeah, I think you're completely right that we miss the forest for the trees by being like, they learned violence from the candy colored, you know, Mm -hmm. World of Warcraft fantasy land. Because like I said, I played World of Warcraft and I can honestly say I've never murdered anyone. (laughs) 
So I'm just saying. Yeah. I grew up playing I grew up playing incredibly violent video games. I my first video game was Diablo and Diablo 2 where you're just you murder everything. That's the that's the goal. That's not what I expected to hear you say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. I love I love a good violent video game. You know what I'm saying? Like um, I've never murdered anyone in real life. Yes, yeah, exactly. I mean, <laughs> that's the thing is, yes, he played this game. And yes, it is a red flag because it was his excuse for dropping out of college. Right. But the game did not make him a horrible person. For Kevin, World of Warcraft is all he wanted to do. He didn't date. He never showed any interest in dating, just dropped out of college, sat in his room playing World of Warcraft, and went to work part-time at Best Buy. A few months later, Kevin's mom, Nora, died in their home from an aspirin overdose. Oh, my God. Her death was ruled accidental. However, Kevin told Corey he blamed himself because he had encouraged her to kill herself. (gasps) Oh. Yeah. I think what happened was they were arguing and she threatened suicide. And he said, quote, go ahead, do it. That is a heavy burden to carry. First of all, what a horrible way to die. Mm-hmm. That is something, oh man, like any kind of those anti-inflammatory suicide attempts are so damaging to your body and so incredibly painful. And I'm so sorry to hear that. And... This is also a kid, right? Or how old is this guy? Uh, At this time, he was 21 years old when his mom died. Okay. That is such a heavy burden to carry. You're 100% correct of of saying something in the heat of the moment and then having to reckon with the idea that you might be culpable. Mm -hmm. And this is a young man and parent relationships are so complicated. What a terrible burden to have to hold on to with your abusive mom. That's the thing. I mean, it sounds like there was a lot of stuff going on in this household. Yeah. And I'm not saying Kevin Loibel deserves any kind of pity here, but that that is a lot. It's complicated. That's a really complicated mm-hmm. relationship that I'm sure does not help your mental health. Yeah. Especially if you're already struggling in some ways. Right. Kevin's dad, Paul, eventually started dating a new woman And it sounds like it was a tumultuous relationship. Over the course of two years, police were called to the home six times over fights between Paul and his girlfriend. These fights usually involved alcohol and were often violent. Paul actually filed for two separate domestic violence injunctions against her. So it sounds like Paul had a pattern of gravitating toward abusive women. One of the times police were called to the home involved a fight between Kevin and his dad's girlfriend. Kevin told police that he had been arguing with her and she was drunk, so he went to his room to escape. She followed him to his room, but he didn't realize it, and she put her hand up, I think so that he couldn't close the door, but not knowing she was there, he slammed the door on her, causing an injury to her wrist. She waited 10 days to report it to police, though, and Kevin was never charged. So clearly things were not stable at home. Kevin's room was his escape. But it wasn't the room you would think of for a single guy in his early 20s. He slept on a thin mattress on the floor, no bed frame. There was nothing on the walls. No pictures, no posters, nothing. There was a dresser with a large TV on it that was connected to a computer tower, and there was a closet, and inside the closet was a filing cabinet, which all of that might not seem super weird. Not having any pictures anywhere is is pretty weird, but otherwise it's like, okay, he's got a TV, a computer, he sleeps on the floor. I dated guys in my early 20s who slept on the floor, so maybe that's not that strange. None of us are above it. We've all slept with a man with no bed spring. Like, we've all been there. (laughs) We certainly have. Raise your hand. Our hands are raised. (laughs) But then you get to the window. Kevin had taped aluminum foil all over his window and hung heavy drapes over that. According to his dad, Paul, Kevin had, quote, 
an aversion to light. Inside one of the drawers of the dress of the dresser were a pair of blue earplugs. And Paul said that those were because Kevin was uncomfortable with loud noises. Paul said Kevin lived like a hermit and only left his room to go to his job at Best Buy. There's a lot to process here. Oh my gosh. The thing that gets me is Kevin was never taken to a therapist. No one in his family sought therapy. No one encouraged him to go to therapy. Not after his mom died. Not after he dropped out of college. Not after police were called to the house six times in two years. No one went, you know what? This isn't a great way to live. There's got to be a better way. It's so frustrating and heartbreaking. You would think at the very least the police could have been like, we've been to this house a number of times for domestic violence. Right. All of you need to see a mental health professional. Mental health is at the root of most of our cases we cover, and it's clear that Kevin was not a mentally healthy person. But this was his normal. This was his family's normal. There are so many red flags with this guy, but no one steps in to say, let's try to get you some help. Well, and like, thinking of this from a 2023 lens you're like oh my gosh he's socially avoidant he has sensory sensitivities mm -hmm. he is under socialized he has only badly formed relationships with women mm -hmm. like these days you're like oh, okay the the therapy lights are screaming yes and it's i think such an interesting thing to remember that we're in 2016 at this point, right? No, this is... What year is it? So his mom died in 2010. Let me double check that. Yeah, his mom died in 2010. Um, and mm -hmm. then his uh, father started dating the new woman shortly after that. And okay, so we are around 2014 at this time. It's not that long ago, you know? No. Like 2014, it's nine years ago, mm -hmm. you know? It's crazy just to think like... We didn't have an understanding or a sensitivity as much to a lot of different uh, spectrums of, of things that require therapy. Exactly. And that being said, some dude starts taping tinfoil to his window. I feel like in most eras, you're like, okay, so. Like, that's odd. What's up, dude? Mm -hmm. What's what's um. Why, why is the filing cabinet in the closet? What's in there? Right. Like, what's do you want a picture frame? We could put a four by six up somewhere. That's in here. what's so weird to me is there weren't even family pictures in his room. Yeah. There, there's no like personal or, or, or personality kind of items in there. Yeah. And you hit the nail on the head with the fact that this, you know, was nine years ago and mental health just wasn't as talked about. And for us yeah. now, it's easy to sit here and be like, oh, clearly, like, he's got some stuff going on and needs to talk to someone. Yeah. It just wasn't talked about then. Yeah. Unfortunately. Then at some point in 2015, Kevin discovered Christina's YouTube channel. And he was hooked. He started devouring everything. Everything he could find on her, every video she made, every TV appearance she had, everything. He became obsessed. He felt like the two of them were a lot alike because they both liked video games. Mm. And like if you've only interacted with women who require the police to come, who better to get obsessed with than this like adorable, mm -hmm. universally beloved, talking directly to yep. camera. I mean, because he lived his life online. Right. So this felt very, like a very real connection for him. Yes. Talking into, a, like directly into your webcam and looking someone in the eyes without having to leave your mm -hmm. room. That must have been incredibly powerful. Yeah. And he loved that she was a devout Christian. Oh. He considered himself an atheist, but told his friend Corey that he was impressed by her faith and she had changed him. Kevin said Christina helped him see the world in a different way and, quote, if there is a God, he sees it in her. Oh, buddy. Corey was like, okay, dude, whatever. <laughs> Corey, along with the rest of Kevin's co-workers, didn't think too much of Kevin's infatuation. They would often tease him about it. He would sit at his workstation and just watch Christina's YouTube videos all day. 
He'd go home and sit in his room and watch her videos. It became his life. He then began monitoring monitoring all of her social media accounts, which is just the internet's way of saying he cyberstalked her. Mm. He didn't have any social media accounts of his own, but he was always checking hers. This obsession went on for months and carried over into 2016. Soon, Kevin started making some pretty drastic changes in his life. He switched to a vegan diet and lost 50 pounds. He got his teeth whitened. He got hair implants to try to cover his receding hairline. And he got LASIK eye surgery. Those are not cheap procedures, so I don't know where he got the money for that stuff. Damn Best Buy, okay. Right? I mean, he did live at home, so he wasn't paying rent. Sure, 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 sure. He didn't have a car. He didn't have a girlfriend. Okay. So I guess he really didn't have, like, a ton of expenses, and he was able to save up some money. Wow, okay. But still, he only works part-time. Uh, yeah. Damn, that LASIK money. I know, right? Call me Best Buy. Shit. Kevin told Corey that all these changes he was making in his life were for Christina. Mm. He said that she was his soulmate and he wanted to improve to improve his appearance for her. And Corey was like, um, the chances of you and Christina Grimmy being soulmates are slim to none, buddy. Kevin got pissed. He told Corey, quote, if you're not going to be supportive of, supportive of me, then I just can't be your friend. Whoa. Corey began to realize that this infatuation of Kevin's was not healthy. So he actually pulled their boss at Best Buy aside to tell him what was going on and to let him know he was concerned. Finally, someone is expressing concern about Kevin and is realizing something is off. Yeah, Corey, Corey, right? Corey, yep. Is the hero of this story. Corey is the hero. We're doing great. Okay. Well, he tried. Okay. Corey told his boss, a man by the name of Luke Dahl, that his relationship with Kevin was deteriorating due to Kevin's unhealthy obsession with Christina Grimmie. Luke did notice Kevin watching Christina's YouTube videos at work, but he never spoke with him about it, not even to say, like, hey, you can't do that when you're on the clock. And all the employees noticed the physical changes taking place in Kevin, the weight loss and all of that, but they said they didn't notice any mental changes, so they didn't think too much of it. But Corey knowing Kevin better than anyone, was concerned. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, when he voiced his concerns to his boss, Luke said, well, Kevin's not acting out at work. There's nothing I can do. I get that it has to be a difficult position for an employer because you can't fire someone for being socially awkward, which is why we need a bigger focus on mental health, (laughs) especially with a company as big as Best Buy. Like, I feel like they would have the resources for employees. Access to mental health professionals, something. Yeah. I got to be honest. Luke is not the hero of this story. This is a very absentee boss Mm -hmm. of like, my employee is watching videos of a female singer all all day day at work. Yes. And there's nothing we can do. Sir, I know you work in an at will hiring firing state. Are you telling me truly? You can't put this dude on a performance improvement plan. Right. And I try to think like, okay, it's been eight years that he's worked there at this point. They have moved him around to every position in the store. Yes! All he does is watch Christina's video. Like, at some point, when do you go, okay, well, you can't do that behavior at work. That's grounds for firing. Literally it, part-time at Best Buy? Exactly. Part-time. Best Buy's loyalty to its employees and its compensation package. <laughs> this is an ad this for- This is an ad for Best Buy. Working part-time at Best Buy. <laughs> oh, man. Kevin continued absorbing all the Christina content he could, including her social media posts. And this meant he saw her posting with her new boyfriend, Stephen Reza. On June 5th of 2016, Kevin reported to his job at Best Buy. He returned some science magazines to Corey that he had borrowed months before. And later that day, he pulled Corey aside, grabbed him by the shoulder and said, I love you, brother. And then said, I'm tired and ready to ascend. Corey didn't know what to think about that. He didn't really think too much of it at the time because he never could have guessed that would be the last time he saw Kevin. Unbeknownst to anyone in Kevin's life, Corey, his coworkers, his family, Kevin had recently purchased two handguns. 
He did so legally, waiting the five-day period between each purchase, and he also purchased a ticket to Christina Grimmie's concert at the Plaza Live Theater in Orlando. On the morning of June 9th, one day before the concert, he called a cab. He paid $200 for a round trip. At 1.30 p.m., after traveling more than 100 miles from St. Petersburg to Orlando, Kevin checked into the courtyard by Marriott. Pierre, the front desk manager, which I think all front desk managers need to be named Pierre. Correct. Checked him in and immediately got a weird vibe. He thought Kevin was, quote, strange. Kevin didn't have any luggage with him, just a small drawstring backpack. I am always suspicious of people who do not have luggage with them, like yes. if it's a hotel or an airport. Big warning sign, just FYI. And those little drawstring backpacks, I swear to God, if it's not a marathon that is currently going on, I'm like, what are you carrying in there? You've got no business for them. No business. In his backpack, Kevin had packed Axe deodorant. Oh, no. I know. I had to say the brand of it. Yeah, thank you. Just because it's Axe deodorant. I'm there. It's 2016. Yeah. I'm there. Okay. The two guns, a five-inch hunting knife, and 75 rounds of bullets. Oh, my gosh. Kevin paid $269 for the room and was scheduled to check out the next morning. He then purchased $16 worth of food from the hotel snack bar and took it up to his room to eat. That night, he slept on top of the covers on the hotel bed. Just that fact alone is enough for me to believe you are mentally disturbed. Who sleeps on top of the covers? <laughs> Get under there. You know they don't wash that as much as the sheets, Kevin. Right. Ugh. The next day, June 10th, he tucked his wallet, cell phone, and concert ticket into his pocket. He clipped two nylon gun holsters to the back of his jeans and used a cloth to strap the hunting knife around his left ankle. In addition to what was loaded in the guns, he had an extra two full 9mm magazines in his front pocket. He wore a red, white, and blue flannel shirt, untucked, which hid the guns from view. He put the rest of his things, which included a gun case, ammunition, and spare magazines, in the drawstring backpack and put the backpack in the safe underneath the TV in his hotel room. And he grabbed a pair of blue earplugs, which he wore that evening. And then he went to Old Navy. What in the fuck? Bought himself a black hat. What a weird fucking thing to do. That I don't understand. He then lined up for the concert. At the time, there were no metal detectors at the Plaza Live Theater. There were no pat-downs, nor were there any video surveillance cameras inside or outside the venue, and their security officers were unarmed. There was a bag check, mainly to make sure people didn't bring in outside food or drinks. Because, you know, God forbid you sneak a granola bar in for a snack. Right. Yeah. Kevin didn't have a bag on him, so he breezed right through security. Once inside, he picked a spot at the very back of the theater to watch the concert. The show starts and Christina goes on stage. She had a great show. As usual, her brother Marcus joined her. He played guitar. The crowd loved her. There were a lot of teenage girls in the audience. And once she was done, she called her boyfriend, Stephen, to say that the show went really well. And she said, I've still got to do the meet and greet. And he was like, okay, well, call me when you get done. The meet and greets were one of Christina's favorite things because she got to interact with her fans. And she considered all her fans friends, as we mentioned earlier. She loved talking with them, signing autographs, taking pictures. She was a very generous performer when it came to her fans because some, you know, have an attitude like I'm better than you or let's hurry this up. I want to get out of here. Right. But not Christina. She loved it. Her fans were like family to her. So the show ends. Marcus and Christina already have the luggage packed to fly back the next morning. It was already loaded on the bus. So they were going to do the meet and greet, head back to the hotel for the night, and then fly out the next morning because she was flying home. Concert goers begin lining up for the meet and greet. It's just after 10 p.m. I think there were at least 100 people in line, but I'm not sure of the exact number. 
Did you say this? Was there like a special ticket you needed to get this? Or is it just like any fans who wanted to meet her could? So there was a VIP like backstage pass. Mm -hmm. But I think that was different from this ticket. I think anyone who had a general admission ticket could line up for the meet and greet if they were willing to wait in line. Wow. Got you. Kevin was one of the concert goers to get in line. He definitely stood out because he was a 27-year-old man. Right. And pretty much Everyone else was a teenage girl. Marcus was right next to Christina. He was manning the merchandise table, and sometimes he would take pictures for fans as they posed with Christina. And when you're a teenage girl and you've grown up watching her on YouTube and on TV, and now you're about to meet her in real life, that is a huge deal. These fans were so excited. Some were there with their moms. It was just like a really fun time. But Marcus noticed Kevin in line. And it struck him as odd that this older guy was in line for the meet and greet by himself. It was clear he was not with anyone else. So Marcus just kind of takes note, keeps an eye on him as he gets closer and closer to the front of the line. There was no security present at this meet and greet. Meanwhile, Christina is all smiles. She's talking to everyone. The mood is really happy. It's upbeat. And then Kevin reaches the front of the line. There are still at least 15 people behind him. He doesn't say anything. He just looks at her. How fucking creepy. I mean, and this is the nightmare as a woman Mm -hmm. of being like, there is a man here. He has not done anything yet. There is no reason why I, in terms of social contract, should be uncomfortable. Right. And yet... I have to decide, is this man a threat to me? How much do I want to make a scene about this? Can I get through this? That is the totally terrifying calculus that comes with a man just standing in front of you, staring at you. Yeah, staring at you. But Christina had such a good heart. And she knew that people got nervous sometimes when they would meet her. So she sensed that he was a little shy, and she did what she would always do when someone seemed nervous to to talk to her. She smiled and opened her arms to give him a hug. Gosh. Without ever saying a word, Kevin took out one of the guns and shot Christina in the right side of the head at point-blank range. She fell to the ground, and he shot her two more times in the chest. Her brother was an arm's distance away from her. It happened so fast. The shots were like pop, pop, pop. Like it was so fast. Marcus sees all of this and lets out this animalistic scream and just jumps on Kevin and tackles him to the ground. And as he put it, quote, just starts wailing on him. At first, concert goers didn't know what was happening. They thought someone was popping balloons. But when they realized there was a shooter, everyone starts screaming and running. People are tripping and falling, trying to get out of there. Marcus continues scuffling with Kevin on the ground, and he actually managed to get the gun away from Kevin. So his first thought is, okay, I got the gun away from him. Right. In that moment, Kevin managed to get loose from Marcus's grip, and Marcus looks at him, and Kevin is holding a gun. The second gun. Mm. Marcus is like, wait, what? How did he get the gun back? And then when he realizes it's a second gun, he's like, okay, he's got me. I'm next. But instead, in a flash, Kevin put the gun up to the side of his head and pulled the trigger. This series of events all happened within seconds. Mm. It was so fast. By this point, all the concert fans had fled No security had shown up yet. Oh, my God. It was just Marcus. He said he looked around and everyone was gone. He was the only one there sitting on the floor with two bodies, one of whom is his sister. He said he looked over at her and she looked peaceful and he knew that she was gone. Mm. He knew that she wasn't suffering. I can't even fathom the anguish Marcus must have suffered to witness all that and to feel like his one job was to protect his sister and this happens. I mean, there's no way he could have prevented it. 
but I'm sure he felt some kind of guilt. Yeah. I just th- hate that he had to go through that and has to live with that memory. Yeah. Tons of people began calling 911. Meanwhile, Mark McDonough, who was the father of the three guys that make up the band Before You Exit, he's also a doctor, and he heard the commotion from backstage, so he peeked from behind the curtains to see what was going on. And he saw the bodies of Christina and Kevin on the floor and Marcus sitting there in the middle of everything. And when he recognized it was Christina on the ground, he ran over to her and he said she tried to take a breath. He felt a weak pulse, but then lost it. So he started CPR. Mm. Emergency crews arrived and rushed her to Orlando Regional Medical Center where she was pronounced dead. And it was at this moment that Bud Grimmy just happened to call Marcus. He just wanted to see how everything was going. That is some parental intuition right there. Yeah. I think he felt something and was like, you know, I'm going to call and check in. Yeah. Marcus was out of breath when he answered. He'd been crying. Emotions were high. He just kept muttering, dad, dad, dad. And when he was able to catch his breath a bit, he said, dad, Christina has been shot and she's no longer with us. For a son to have to give that news to his father, I cannot imagine. Bud couldn't comprehend it at first. He said, what? She's okay, right? She's going to be okay? When Tina Grimmy heard the news, she screamed and fell to the floor. No family should ever have to go through this kind of tragedy. It's so senseless. At this point, it was really late. I think it was just after midnight. And Stephen, Christina's boyfriend, had fallen asleep. He woke up to the sound of his phone ringing and he thought, oh, it's Christina. She must have finished the meet and greet because he'd been waiting for her call. Right. But when he answered, Bud was on the other end of the line. And he told Stephen, Christina went home to be with the Lord. Homicide detective Michael Moreschi, or it might be Moreschi, I'm not sure, said this was the most tragic case he'd ever worked, mainly because it was just so senseless and there didn't seem to be a clear motive. Mm. Police retrieved Kevin's phone from his pocket and sent it to their digital forensic examiner, Detective Charlie Troll, but Kevin had encrypted it and they weren't able to get any information from it. Also in Kevin's pocket was the room key to the Marriott. So they went there where they talked to Pierre. As soon as they showed Pierre Kevin's picture, he said, oh, is he a suspect in the shooting? Because he'd gotten a strange feeling from him when he checked him in and he just knew. Mm. When investigators checked Kevin's hotel room, they found the backpack in the safe with the extra ammunition And based on how much ammunition Kevin had on him at the time, plus what was in the hotel room, police are pretty sure he would have committed mass murder had Marcus not tackled him. Mm. While they were searching his hotel room, the front desk called up to say a cab had arrived to pick up Kevin because he had paid for a round trip ticket. The round trip cab. Oh, my God. So I wonder if he thought he was going to get away with it. And was planning on just going back home afterwards, like nothing happened. Because why buy a round trip ticket? Yeah, what was the plan? And why lock his things in a hotel safe if he wasn't planning on returning? Or more ammunition, too. That did strike me as weird when you said that of like, Mm -hmm. why not bring it with you? Why do you need it? Like, why are you going to come back to it? Is there another ammunition need that's going to spring up for you? Yeah, I mean... I unfortunately will never know what his plan was. Yeah. Tucked into Kevin's pocket at the scene of the crime was a flyer for a burial service where they would cremate the body and spread the ashes around a tree. And when investigators found this, they interpreted it as Kevin never planned on returning home. He had always planned on killing himself. But part of me thinks he brought that flyer to leave at Christina's body. Yeah. I don't think he ever anticipated getting tackled by Marcus. And when that happened, I think he felt like the only way out was to kill himself. I don't know. We'll never know. It is so interesting with that 
that I'm ready to ascend comment to his friend. Right. There's that. But also to make so many detailed plans to pay for the return cab. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I think probably the most likely explanation is the simplest, which is like, this is a man who's mentally so unwell. Yeah. Who can both like plan to return back home and think logically like... I'm going to kill all these people and then they're going to let me walk back to the Marriott? Like, yeah, I don't know what his thought process was there. Yeah. It's so, it's, I mean, and I'm glad I don't know. I don't ever want to be able to understand that thought process. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Investigators ran a background check on Kevin. He had no criminal history and had never been subjected to a mental health evaluation under the Baker Act. The Baker, sorry, the Baker Act is a Florida law that allows for the involuntary mental health examination of someone. For example, if a son encouraged his mom to kill herself, and she did, and then years later police were called to the same home because of an altercation between that same son and his dad's new girlfriend, under the Baker Act, the dad could have had his son examined for mental illness. Hypothetically. Hypothetically speaking. If if that situation had occurred. If that was like ever going to happen. Yeah. But that never happened in Kevin's case. Investigators were concerned that Kevin might have harmed his family because, as we've seen in several of these cases, sometimes a person planning to commit murder, mass murder in particular, kills his family first with the excuse that, quote, he wants to spare them the pain of what he's about to do. Right. But Kevin had not harmed his family. The St. Petersburg police were notified of what happened and they called Paul and Chris, Kevin's dad and brother. Then Orlando police went to the Loyable home. Paul was distraught. He didn't even know Kevin had gone to Orlando, which that alone tells me a lot about this household. Yeah. He said Kevin had never been diagnosed with a mental illness, but again, he was never evaluated for one. Mm -hmm. He said he'd never heard Kevin mention Christina Grimmie's name. He didn't know he had purchased any guns. He said he'd never threatened to harm himself or anyone else. And the last time he saw his son was on the 9th when Kevin got into the cab, but he didn't know where he was going. Your kid gets in the cab and you're not like, where are you off to? Like a man who doesn't right. have a car and only goes to Best Buy? Dad? Yeah. And he, he rode his bike to Best Buy because, again, he did not have a car. So it's like you're getting into a cab. You, you've literally never gotten into a cab. Like No red flags. Okay. When police searched Kevin's bedroom, they noted that this was not the room of a mentally healthy man. They also discovered the same flyer for that burial service that he had had in his pocket. There was another one on his dresser. Inside the filing cabinet in Kevin's closet was the second gun case, as well as more ammunition and spare magazines. So much ammunition. Like, literally, what is happening? I don't. Under, I don't know what his plan was. And the side panel of Kevin's computer tower was missing. Investigators took the computer tower for forensic examination, but Kevin had destroyed the hard drive and Detective Troll wasn't able to get anything. So then again, it's like, why encrypt your phone and destroy your hard drive if you are planning to kill yourself? Right. Because if you're not planning on being around, why do you care? What they find. Right. Oh, I don't know. Marcus said Christina had not received any threats from anyone prior to the shooting. They had never had a problem with any fans before, and Kevin and Christina did not know each other. Before attending the concert, Kevin had told his co-workers that he and Christina played video games online together, but this was never confirmed. He also told them he had attended another concert of hers a few months prior, But when police checked into that, it was determined that Kevin had worked at Best Buy that day and the concert, uh, that day of the concert, and he had not attended. Okay. So he's living in kind of an alternate reality. Wow. I also just want to say those, the employees of Best Buy should be feeling like they dodged maybe a literal bullet. Because I can't imagine where else this dude is going with more magazines, you know? Exactly. I mean, if he's keeping some in his room... Right. Is he saving them for later? What like what is going on? Also, can I just ask the he it was the tower, the the piece of plastic off of his computer tower was missing? Yeah, so he for whatever reason destroyed that because he wanted to get into it to destroy the hard drive. I see. And just never put that side panel back on. Okay, gotcha. 
Investigators examined Christina's phone and found no evidence of any contact between her and Kevin. So the fact that it made it that he made it impossible for his phone and computer to be searched makes me think, like we said, that he wasn't planning on killing himself. Maybe he was just trying to be a dick and keep everyone guessing his motives. Some killers do that. They want to go to their grave with their secrets. They get some weird high off of it. I don't know. Kevin's family taped a sign on their front door. I'm going to post a picture of it. It has some grammatical errors that make you think, yeah, maybe something's just not quite right in the household. The sign read, Deepest sorrow for lost to the family, friends, and fans of the very talented, loving Christina Grimmy. No other comets. Comets as in C-O-M-M-E-T-S. Hmm. We'll never fully understand why Kevin murdered Christina, but it's been surmised that he found out she had a boyfriend and had this if I can't have her, no one can attitude. Adam Levine paid for Christina's funeral, and her manager, Brian Teefee, started a GoFundMe for the family. Christina's funeral was held in New Jersey on the 16th, and a memorial service was held the following day. I watched this service online when I was researching this. I'm not going to post it just because it feels weird to do so, but it's pretty easy to find if you want to watch it. It's Mm -hmm. really beautiful. Um, And one of the parts that really stood out was her two best friends, Sarah and Lauren, went up together to speak and they shared stories and jokes. I was simultaneously laughing and bawling my eyes out. It's really (laughs) powerful. You can just feel how much this girl was loved and what an impact she had on so many people. I mean, there are hundreds of people at this memorial service. Marcus said, quote, I feel very blessed because tragedies happen every day and people are left with nothing. Christina left behind video pictures, records. So we have so much to hold on to and it helps us cope because it feels like she's still here with us. The Grimmy family did file a wrongful death lawsuit against the concert promoter, the owner of the venue, and the security company working the event. But the case was dismissed because Florida law does not allow business owners to be held liable for attacks on their property. They were able to refile the suit. They just had to make a distinction between the concert promoter and the venue owner. Their new lawsuit was allowed to move forward in which the Grimmies claim that the defendants failed to take adequate security measures to ensure the safety of the performers and the attendees at the concert venue, which is true. There was barely any security there and you've got hundreds of people at this venue, but the judge said more research was needed before moving forward. While they were dealing with this court case, The Grimmie family also started the Christina Grimmie Foundation, which raises money to give directly to families impacted by gun violence. I'm going to post a link to their donation page. If every single person listening to this donated even just $1, that could make a huge impact. Please, 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 if you have the means, please donate to their foundation. Sadly, in 2018, Christina's mom passed away from cancer. I mean, this family, my God. I know. God. Bud and Marcus have been through so much in, sh- in such a short amount of time. And in 2019, Christina's boyfriend, Stephen, was diagnosed with an incurable form of brain cancer. Come on. Seriously. When does it end? These people <laughs> have gone through so much. Oh, my gosh. In December of 2019, three years after they filed the first lawsuit, the Grimmies voluntarily dismissed the case. I think it had just dragged out for so long and they'd already been through so much. Right. They were just ready to be done. I can't blame them. Yeah. The movie Christina had done, The Matchbreaker, premiered in October of 2016, four months after her murder. So sadly, she didn't get to see her film debut. She also didn't get to see the release of her second album titled All is Vanity, which her family released posthumously a year after her death. There is no doubt in my mind she would have dominated the music industry had she been given the chance because she was well on her way. Yeah. I read somewhere that since Christina's murder, the Plaza Live Theater has installed at least one video surveillance camera inside the venue. But when I went back to find that source and see what other security measures were now in place, I couldn't find anything about it. So we can only hope that the plaza 
along with all other venues, employ the proper security measures to protect people because this country has a major problem with gun (laughs) violence. Yes. Just two days after Christina's murder, the Pulse nightclub shooting happened. In addition to the donation link, I'm also going to post a link to Christina's website where you can buy merch. All of the proceeds go towards the foundation. They have clothing, wall art, cell phone cases, drinkware. A lot of the stuff has the logo of her first album with love because a lot of this was merch that she already had. And so they're just trying to sell it to make some money for this foundation. I can tell you right now, I have my eye on the joggers. They're so freaking cute. (laughs) They're black and they say with love and hot pink and they're so cute. So I'm going to post that link so you can buy some merch and support the Christina Grimmie Foundation in the process. The store is literally run by Bud and Marcus out of the Grimmie's garage. So be patient with them as they work to get orders out. This case, it had an impact on me. It's one of those I can't stop thinking about because she was so young and talented and just such a great human being. The bit about her opening her arms to her killer is so moving. Like what a pure soul to be like, I mean, and and it's funny because my first reaction was like, there's a strange man staring at me. How do I make myself safe? And Christina Grimmie's first impression was, how do I make this man feel welcomed? How do I make him feel safe? Exactly. That is who she was. (laughs) That is so sad. This whole case is just heartbreaking. I think I think today's lesson is just because someone doesn't act violent doesn't mean they aren't capable of violent acts. Mm. Because when you look at Kevin's background, the way he lived, how secluded he kept himself, he's 27 and he's still living at home. Mm-hmm. Managers can't figure out what position to put him in at work. All of that adds up to a mentally unhealthy person. And people need to take notice. Someone needs to say like, hey, something's off here. Let's get this person some help. Corey tried, but his boss said there was nothing he could do. So we have to start putting a bigger focus on mental health. I don't know. This case, I will say I cried multiple times researching this, mainly because I just went down a rabbit hole on her YouTube channel, which I'm going to link. And I was just like, man, this girl was just a light. Like she was just awesome. And her voice is insane. Like, right. And the fact that she can just like play anything on the piano, I have zero skill with that. Like I cannot just (laughs) pick up an instrument. Like, yeah, yeah. But she could play anything. She wrote her own song. She could cover anybody's song. Yeah, I mean, I have to revisit this. I have such a strong sense memory of like I can see her little like shaggy haircut and her like black eyeliner. Yeah, she like her hair was very trademark. Yes. I'm like, I can just see her in my mind and the way she looked when she's saying like, I have such a strong memory of that. And it's also just hard to be like, like, so, and I'm sure you come across this all the time in your cases where it's like so many people failed both the Mm. victim and the perpetrator, right? Like so many people let Christina Grimmie down by not protecting her and it wasn't her brother, you know, like it was exactly it was all of the people who were not there when she died. And yeah, also all these people let, you know, Kevin down too. of like, this yeah. is a man who is not well. He is not well in every aspect of his life. And no one, the the social net wasn't there for him either. You know, yeah. there wasn't help when he needed it. Oh, it's just so fucking heartbreaking. Yeah. Um, We want to hear what you think. You can. Let us know in the comments. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, or YouTube. At Horrorwood Podcast. Or email us at horrorwoodpodcast at gmail.com. Perfect. (laughs) And if you were thinking, you know what? I'm going to do it. I am going to finally join their Patreon. Don't. Take that $5 that you were going to use on our Patreon and instead donate it to the Grimmy Foundation. That is our ask for this episode. Uh, We just want to give them as much support as we can because they are doing amazing work there. And as usual, we ask that you don't do murder and also never read the comments. A huge (laughs) thank you to Emily for being here. You were awesome. Um, I can't thank you enough. And I'm sorry that this case was so tragic.
Damn, I told you. Okay, I told you when you asked me to do this. I was like, listen, I am not a horror podcast. I'm not a murder podcast. You I'm did not tell a scary me. podcast. So just know I'm happy to be here. And then what do you do? You make me sad about a childhood hero. Yes, I'm, I ripped your heart out. And then I stomped on it. I know. And then I spit on it. And then I handed it back to you. And it was all dripping with saliva. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> An absolute pleasure. 